Hello and welcome to another edition of Lunch and Learn with Legacy Washington. Legacy is a history program housed in the office of Secretary of State Kim Wyman, along with our colleagues in the State Archives and Library. I'm Bob Young, a historian with Legacy, and I'm very excited about today's interview. We're covering the launch of a new book by Legacy's chief historian, John C. Hughes. It's a biography of Julia Butler Hansen, uh, who uh, was from tiny Kathlamet in southwestern Washington and went on to become the most powerful woman in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, Julia was colorful and complicated, which John's book captures so well. She was the author of children's books uh, who uh, could cuss like a logger. She was a Christian scientist who smoked cigarettes and drank martinis. And um, she was above all tough enough to succeed in the man's club of politics then while retaining uh, a tender side. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, John Hughes. Welcome, John. Great to see you. Great to be here, Bob. Thank you. I'm just really excited about this. Um, and I'm excited know, that you've been excited by this book. I have to tell you, <laughs> teammate, that when in the long, dark nights of the onset of the pandemic, when I was plowing through this and trying to be fastidious, that your enthusiasm for this book and the way you got who Julia was really mattered a lot to me. And I appreciate that. Thank you, John. I mean, you deserve many kudos for um, you know, I think showing the complexity of Julia, uh, she was not without flaws and and also I'll the complexity that. of her work, but of course doing it in such a accessible and readable style. And uh, part of, I think, the success of the book um, comes from your personal familiarity with Julia. Uh, when and how did you first meet her? In the fall of 1960, when I was a freshman at Grace Harbor College in Aberdeen, Julia, newly elected to Congress, came to Grace Harbor College for a forum on student involvement. And my mom always told me, John, if you're always early, you'll never be late. Seems like a lot of being a fortune cookie. So I was early and I was sitting in a conference room table in the boardroom at Grace Harbor College. And my congresswoman strolled in and she took off her coat and she sat down and extended her hand. I, I, I sort of knew who she was, but I'd never met her. And uh, she eyed this package of Pall Mall cigarettes at my elbow. And I was 17 years old. And I thought now that I was a collegian that I ought to be smoking to show myself to be more sophisticated. So I offered her one of my Pall Malls. It was unfiltered and Julia with this wonderful motion took the unfiltered cigarette and tapped it on her watch crystal to pack down the little shards of tobacco at the end. She leaned over and I gave her a light from my new Zippo lighter. Uh, and then we, she told me all, just lapsed into these wonderful stories that in 1936, when she was a young Democrat, she had come to Aberdeen, which was then like, I think the fifth or sixth largest city in the state for a, a, a Democratic state convention at the uh, Moore Hotel, uh, now a derelict landmark, but in that day, uh, a veritable skyscraper in Aberdeen. And Warren Magnuson, the, the young King County prosecutor, was presiding over that convention, and he found a way to bring the warring factions of the leftists in the Washington Commonwealth Federation, many of whom were card-carrying communists, albeit uh, secretly, and the more country mice mainstream Democrats together. And we just had 15 or 20 minutes to, to talk. And she was about to tell me about the day she met Franklin D. Roosevelt when the student body president and the head of the political science club came in. And that was the end of my chance to talk to Julia. But she was she told me, too, that her dream in college and in and, and high school where she had been a correspondent for the Tacoma Daily Newspaper from Buckley High School was to be a journalist. And, and so fast forward six years later, I'm through with college. I'm out of the Air Force. I'm looking for a job and I get hired by the Aberdeen Daily World as a political reporter. And next thing I know, I'm talking to Congresswoman Hanson a lot. 
And as I moved up the chairs to be like a city editor and editorial page editor during that whole era, we talked often and she visited often because Southwest Washington was um, hugely important to uh, her role as chairman of the interior subcommittee on appropriations and related on uh, interior and related agencies. Right. So you covered her from that that meeting over the yep. unfiltered Pall Mall cigarette with a yep. Zippo lighter, yep. um, evocative of a time when I'm not endorsing cigarettes, but uh, evocative of a time when, um, you know, uh, sharing a cigarette or a lighter was a, a bond amongst uh, many Americans. And, and it evokes a time. And, and from there, the book is off and running. And uh, you have the benefit of then covering Julia for the next uh, 14 years of her tenure in Congress. Yep. Um, uh, in addition to your personal touch, John, there's there's a great intimacy to this book, part of which derives from your access to diaries that Julia began keeping at the age of 15. Some of them are quite candid. And so how did you get access to those diaries and what kind of flavor did they bring to your storytelling? Well, in all these all these years that, that you and I, as former journalists, know about uh, the, I think it's Ben Bradley's great quote about the first rough draft of history. Um, then later, in midway in my career, when um, thanks to my friend and mentor, the late Murray Morgan, author of the immortal Skid Row, you'll notice that I did not call Murray Morgan's uh, Skid Row <laughs> iconic. Uh, one, of, one of Bob's least favorite words, but. Uh, the I started doing serious history, and it began in 1999 when the newspaper staff at the Daily World, uh, under my direction, set out to compile stories of the century on body old Grace Harbor for a book that we were going to publish. And that book has sold eight or ten thousand copies. It's now on its about sixth printing. And it, it what I learned from um, that project in visiting the state archives, the University of Washington archives, WSU, the Walter P. Ruther uh, Labor Library in, in Michigan yeah. was about uh, the, the wow. real grunt work of doing serious history. So the, the answer to your question is, it's in a historian's dream to have access to somebody's journals. Uh, Robert Carroll uh, would swoon if he had uh, <laughs> access to uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's inner thoughts back when he was the master of the Senate or engaged in some of those uh, elections that uh, where a lot of ballots disappeared somewhere <laughs> in the bowels of rural Texas. But so David Hansen, Julia's son, is a retired Fort Vancouver historian. He was the curator, the first curator at the Fort Vancouver historic site. David being his mother's son, is an absolutely just grew up steeped in all of this history from Kath Lamott and his mother's interest in historical research to these books that she'd written for young readers. Yeah. And Julia, to her great credit, even though she'd had mixed emotions at times, never destroyed her diaries. And we'll, and we'll get to a little bit later. There was a time when she wondered, should I burn it? Should I save it for posterity? So when I went to see David for the first time and said, I'm going to do this book. I've wanted to do this book for about 40 years. And he forked over the diaries. And there were not only Julia's diaries beginning at age 15, journals, she called them sometimes, diaries other times, but Maude Kimball Butler, her mother's diaries. Mm. Uh, and so I, talk about original source materials. I mean, and she confided things to these diaries that are they're, they're alternately charming and heartbreaking uh, for example her miscarriage after her first pregnancy mm. shortly after she was first married and the the pain of that uh, miscarriage in the 1940s and the convalescence and the uh, mm. what seems to me to be postpartum depression over the loss of that child she confided all of this it was just marvelous there's um uh, but it Starting early on in her high school and college days, there's one uh, one of these. We talked earlier about um, what would be my most favorite passage, and that's hard because there's so many. But there's this one from January 17th, 1926, mm. and uh, and this is Julia. She said, 
just between you and me, Diary, I do wish some of the boys on this campus, that was Oregon State Agricultural College, now OSU, I do wish some of the boys on this campus would call up once in a while. And since this is just for us, I wish I liked the house better. That was the Daughters of the American Revolution House. And I wish I could write for publication. I just love to write stories, and yet I'm scared, shall I say that, to really sit down and plot out and write a story. Oh, I do, I wish I were, I do wish I were a better Christian scientist. There, you alluded to that earlier. Julia was a, what, one, on one hand, a prayerful Christian scientist, and on the other hand, as David puts it well, so well, you're not supposed to smoke, drink, and cuss, which she did, did with great abandon <laughs> and authenticity. So some people um, who learned to cuss early on or mimic, it sounds affected, but Julia cussed. She was a good cusser. Uh, and there's, there's Julia again. But I guess we all start humbly, and our maker really will rescue us, perfect or not, and help us for God is a loving father and forgiveth all. Now it gets good. Now, diary, this is just for us. Sometimes I do like to write down what's at the very bottom of my heart. It helps heaps. Someday I hope to, to travel. Oh, the magic of the Orient, the lure of East Indochina. <laughs> Singapore in a green jaded light as its mystic, mystic evening sets in. Its atmosphere, Oriental, ancient, cruel, almost enshrouds me. I see the sensual, full-lipped women slinking low in the dives of sailors, a Carmen in her dark glory, and then on into Russia, a peasant throng, the mounted Cossacks, terror of, their, terror of the northern steppes, fly by on steeds as fiery as their vodka and their scary linen. For all the modernism has not displaced the age-old customs. Europe, half Western, half Eastern, modern, Oh, so modern in its post-war frenzy to forget the four awful years made up of terror-stricken days. Back again, I'd come to my land of the free, my dream fulfilled, a life more rich. Oh, the magic and travel. Then almost parenthetically, this is just for us, Diary, and only because I feel like writing something beautiful. Wow. She's like 19 years old then. What? It's just like, it's She's just... really right. Yeah. And, and they, I'm gonna, they, they... later on, I'm going to... I could have written a whole chapter about her love of poetry and some of the wonderful poems I wrote. So the first time in since back in the day, I once visited Julia, her historic home in Kath Lamet, of uh, her her uh, twenty four year twenty four years older uh, former logging camp blacksmith uh, husband Henry, just a salt of the earth guy, but really really bright, and she adored him. So I went there to visit David when we were talking about the book and really get, getting going. And there's books, books all over this house, bookshelves. And in Julia's office, I pulled down a volume of Walt Whitman poems. And of all the things I studied as an English major at the University of Puget Sound, I loved Walt Whitman. And when I opened the book, it was bookmarked with a little fly leaf, like a, a note paper from the office of Julia Butler Hansen. And it was bookmarked at one of Whitman's greatest poems. Huh. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourned and yet shall mourn with ever returning spring. I just wow. about I just about swooned when I read that. <laughs> and listen, listen to what she wrote in 1939 when she's falling in love with Henry. He's this gentle, callous hand. Uh, old blacksmith guy who could fix anything. Um, could lift could lift a 300 pan yeah, animal. Yeah, yeah. Listen, listen, listen to what she wrote. Emily Dickinson would have been proud to have had her byline on the on this stanza. Slim fingers of a finer craftsman than I drew the lines of a woman's life and designed her way with cunning eyes. True. That, wow. That's good writing. Yeah. Wow. That's something. So um, uh, Julia was born, one could say, a, a feminist in 1907. Uh, or at least, uh, I, as I said, she uh, was born with a suffragist blood. Um, how did her mother, who was a trailblazing woman in her own right, uh, most influence Julia? Well, well Maud Kimball Butler, Julia's mother, um, born in Kathlamet, 
uh, well, no, I misspoke, born in Portland and then arrived in Taflamet with her parents as a child. Maude Kimmel Butler was a uh, elected Waukeacum County Superintendent of Schools at the age of 23. Um, it, it, that was 1903, if I recall. The historian should remember. I think it was in 1903. And the galling thing was for the, the women of Washington Territory, as we've written in our in the book that I'm so proud to have co-written with you called Ahead of the Curve about the, these suffragists at the turn of the century and the latter day women uh, who, who are carrying the torch forward for equal rights on America. I'll say, um, my gosh, Stephanie Kuntz, former Governor Gregoire, who pushed through the comparable worth settlement that you wrote about so so eloquently. Anyway, Maud Kimball Butler was um, a pistol, and her mother, Julia's namesake, Julia Ann Blood Kimball, was, uh, had really bristled in the 1880s that uh, she said on one occasion, uh, in something Julia wrote in her diary that her grandmother was greatly incensed that guys uh, at the political hall were being plied with booze to go down and vote, cast their vote, sort of a Tammany Hall kind of ward healer kind of thing. And here she was, an educated woman from patriot stock, colonial stock, bona fide daughters of the American Revolution stock. She is barred from voting by all this jujitsu that we've written about that the courts and the legislature ha had done. So uh, Julia came by that. And by the way, her mother and her grandmother, like most people in Washington state, women, men, alike, this was a Republican state until the coming of the New Deal. And uh, so Julia, in one of her little declarations of independence, uh, angered her grandmother uh, in uh, 1912 by uh, had a little fistful of Woodrow Wilson uh, flyers that she was taking around the neighborhood that sort of scandalized her, her grandma. So <laughs> she, she so, had, the, she, you're right. She's a feminist stock. How did, how did Maude do you think uh, influenced Julia most? Well, there's this, um, she influenced Julia with her her um, her intellect, her kindness, and her activism. Julia um, lost her her grandmother, her father, and her kid brother in the space of about eighteen months. Um, mm. Grandmother um, died of multiple causes, uh, heart failure and the like. The uh, father died of diabetes. And the little brother was uh, run over in the first uh, traffic fatality in Waukeacum County history. I believe uh, Donald was six years old. And there was a, a real uh, family tragedy. The little boy had dashed across the street when the bread wagon arrived uh, to pick up some uh, loaves of bread for his mom. And just then around the corner came a family friend, a, a young teenager, uh, from the Domit family, Dumits and Domits of Kathlamet, and the boy darted out in front of the Domit uh, general store delivery truck and was fatally injured. So Julia always said that she, she never knew anyone who pushed ahead with more pluck and perseverance and goodwill than her mother. And her mother's example widowed, hmm. uh, the, the matriarch is gone, losing a son, and in the wake of that, um, Maude, by the way, there's a wonderful story that when Maude was pregnant with Julia in 1906, 1907, the school board was scandalized that uh, a woman who was great with child would want to keep on with her job as a superintendent of schools. And Maude said, fine on that. Uh, um, that's uh, balderdash. Uh, and, and subsequently, <laughs> She had some run-ins with the school board because she felt that the schools were substandard, that they needed to tax the electorate more, they need to build better schools. So after these multiple tra tragedies, Maude up and packed off and got a job in, uh, in Ording uh, as uh, the first principal, female principal of the school there, and they moved. And uh, that was a, a really important time. Julia got to go to Buckley High School, which had a lot bigger curriculum 
bigger town than Calf Lambert, and she just reveled in that. Um, was the editor of the school paper, the humor magazine, wrote for the Tacoma Ledger as a stringer. Um, it was a really uh, a really important time in her life. And moreover, Maud, who had, um, as they said back in the day, uh, became a, a teacher without much credentials. Uh, teachers were in such short supply that uh, with a high school degree and maybe a year of at a teacher's college, you could be easily credentialed to teach by the superintendent of public instruction. So she was, I think, 17 years old when she began teaching in those one-room schoolhouses along the Columbia with these barefoot kids, Finn kids, immigrant, all kinds of immigrant kids. And she, Maud, when she got to Ording and Buckley, decided that she was going to go to um, Bellingham Normal School, the teacher's college, every summer and, by God, get herself a four-year degree. So every hmm. summer they would decamp to Bellingham, and that was another um, another way for Julia to be around a, a college setting and, and, and really have the wick of, of intellect lit in her, her, her mind. Hmm. So Julia is uh, then um, first elected to the Washington House in 1938 um, as a Democrat. And I'm just um, wondering, John, how the Depression might have informed her politics when she takes office after the election of 38. Well, the Depression, the Depression had informed her politics uh, with the coming of the New Deal, as Arthur Schlesinger put it. Uh, in in uh, 1932, but earlier, um, when Julia graduated from uh, the University of Washington with a degree of home economics, she had abandoned her dream of becoming a journalist, feeling that it would have been uh, really tough sledding for a woman to, to do serious work in journalism beyond the women's pages and society pages uh, at that time. So she, she was always interested in uh, cooking and home economics. So she started a tea room in Bellingham uh, in not very good timing. And she ended up over the next six months as all the mills closed one after another in rapid succession, uh, feeding a lot of hungry people. And um, I left out a very important thing. During the University of Washington years, junior and senior years, when she transferred from Oregon, she worked in a settlement house in Seattle, run by the um, a Jewish organization that was modeled on the landmark work of Jane Adams at Hull House in Chicago. In that, Julia had always had this strong social conscience, and that that really um, it, it grew from there. So the the stories that um, her former tea room employees tell her about giving away most of the the leftovers and a lot of the freshly baked and cooked food out the front and the back door. So she comes back home to Kath Lamet, And by then, um, she had been really active in the Young Democrats. She had, as she put it, finally converted mother to becoming a Democrat. Mother had lost, all the glitter had gone off poor Herbert Hoover. It was at the time, <laughs> one, of my great, one of the great quotes I read about Hoover when I was doing the research was that in 1931, it was said that a rose in his hand would have wilted. <laughs> I just love that. But wow. she comes home to Kath Lamet. She's a young Democrat. She runs for the town council. 1934, there's this really, uh, in, talk about her dream of writing for publication. Julia's uh, young adult novel called Singing Paddles about uh, a family's trek on the Oregon Trail to Kath Lamet and a stop at the Whitman ma Mansion with Marcus Whitman in uh, all that, based on all the pioneer lore that she'd, uh, she'd absorbed from growing up in Kath Lamet, it won the equivalent of a, a Caldecott Award uh, for children's literature in 1934, and she got uh, $500. And if, wow. if memory serves that on the inflation calculator, that extrapolates to about three thousand dollars. So that tied her over. She runs for a, she's a young Democrat, quickly becomes vice president of the young Democrats statewide, meets Jackson and Magnuson and uh, a whole host of other young Democrats, 
idolizes Frances Perkins, the first female Probably. cabinet member in Roosevelt's cabinet, starts corresponding with for Frances Perkins and um, runs for the, the town council. Uh, 1938, she runs for the legislature and she wins decisively. Um, the, it, it, it was quite a campaign. And that, I believe at that time there were six women in the Washington legislature. Yeah, and how did how did Julia f fare in that pale males club um, with th the discrimination um, that she did face, um, and so challenging, and as is, it remains probably today for a woman in that position, if she's too strong, then tell us about that, Sean. Well, well Julia had this quality of being a man's woman and a woman's woman. Mm. She, um, in some respects, she was a shapeshifter because um, by hanging around with all the loggers and uh, the longshoremen and old characters she met along the wharves of Calf Lamet and places like Skamakaway and Astoria, uh, during uh, the, the she, her, one of her first jobs uh, on the town council was to be in public works, and then later she went to work in the county engineer's office. And by 1938, the guys on the road crews in, in Wakayakum pretty much figured that she could run a road grader if they'd let her try. She, <laughs> uh, for all I know, she did. But she really could be this woman who, on the one hand, could go to a Daughters of the American Revolution meeting with a corsage and pour tea and be very decorous. And on the other hand, as you noted, and I heard firsthand, she could cut like a sailor. And it wasn't one of those put on things like you hear some dilettante kid or some person trying to sound like their raw edge, tough. Julia could talk. Julia could cuss. <laughs> and the, uh, so when she would sit down uh, in the, the, the chief clerk of the Washington House was a very wily character who took a liking to Julia immediately, and they were smoke break buddies. I really like, by the way, the fact that, that I have to say this, Bob Young, that when you started reading the chapters of this book, I, I, you did just amused and, and tickled me so much that you pointed out that there was a lot of smoking in this book because that's what people did in college. We smoked, and we now know that smoking is can kill you. And in fact, it killed Julia. Uh, not yeah. to get way far ahead of the story, but right. um, so in 1939, she's a freshman, and she becomes immediately because she's got this moxie that in. All these stories about Julia smacking a guy. Well, there's one story that she she decked a guy in front of the courthouse and insulted her. There's another story that she'd slapped a guy who said that she was only a woman and not from Seattle. Therefore, she didn't deserve a, a spot on a committee in the legislature. But in 1939, she scored this amazing bipartisan triumph for women, not to mention a freshman legislator. With all eight female legislators, eight there were, and the Secretary of State, Belle Reeves, who deserves a book of her own. She was just a overworked phrase is force of nature. Well, Bill was the real deal. This tiny woman, newspaper woman, no less. Anyway, Clarence Martin, the governor, uh, a sort of a conservative Democrat, pretty smart guy, uh, signed into law Julia's 50-50 Act. And the 50-50 Act was designed to give women a fair share of political party leadership. And it's still in force today. And it stipulates that the chairman and the vice chairman of each political party's county and state central committees had to be of the opposite gender. And Julia said, some of you dandies have always claimed you had the women's vote in your pocket. She told her male colleagues, now is your chance to prove your earnestness. And they approved mm, it. So, good, good. By 1942, um, she is a bona fide a, a, a candidate for Speaker of the Washington State House of Representatives. They, in, as Julia put it so well, they screwed me out of that one. And uh, a few years later, they screw her out of the next one. But she was, they were 
very, very impressed by her parliamentary chops. Right. And because right. she had spent several months working in the code revisor's office at the Washington State House before she was elected to legislature. Another thing I, I admire about her and the book is, is yes, she she wasn't a bomb thrower, if you will. She learned how the house worked, Absolutely. and that became her knowledge, her understanding, her cunning, if you will. Um, uh, then uh, uh, caused um, others to recognize. Um, uh, how good she was at this job. Um, and by the way, I feel I have to mention, since you mentioned 42, in 1943, I think it was, um, she was a sponsor of or sponsored the Equal Pay Act Absolutely. in the state of, state of Washington. Again, um, John's book about Julia is part of our overall um, project called Ahead of the Curve about trailblazing women in Washington. And there, Washington was 20 years ahead of the federal law uh, on equal pay, which Julia had a hand in, of course, when she was in Congress. But um, back to the Speaker of the House. Um, so Julia was came one vote shy of becoming the first female speaker. And to give a sense of how far ahead of the curve she was, it wasn't until 60 years later when the Washington House in 2019 elected its first female speaker, Lori Jenkins. And I was just wondering, John, if um, discrimination you think played a part, or sexism played a part in Julia's coming one vote shy of becoming that speaker. Uh, thanks for reminding me that uh, when I uh, had a chat with Speaker Jenkins uh, at the rollout for uh, Ahead of the Curve, I mentioned to her that Julia was upcoming and she confessed that she had not heard of Julia Butler Hanson. So I need to make wow. certain that, that the first female speaker of the House of Representatives has a copy of the book. The, in 1955, by 1955, Julia had been um, wooed repeatedly to run for Congress by Senators Jackson and Magnuson. Um, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, uh, and also had, by dint of her knowledge of highway planning, at the dawn of the Eisenhower era of interstate highways. Another thing that impresses me about um, your scholarship, Bob, is that lately, and during uh, my research for this book, we, we both developed a new appreciation for Dwight D. Eisenhower's prescience, first as a young uh, tank officer during the First World War, that, and then as Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, uh, to see what the Audubons, Hitler's vaunted Audubons, could do for, for transportation, um, both militarily and civilian. So uh, fast forward to 1955, Julia is now the chairman of the Washington State House of Representatives uh, Committee on Roads and Bridges, chairman of the Joint Interim Committee on Highways, Roads and Bridges, chairwoman of the 11 Western Interstate Highway Planning Commission, uh, hailed in the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times as the most form as one of the most formidable experts on highway planning in America, mm -hmm. um, going to White House meetings. Uh, Oliver, 1955, she stands for election to uh, as Speaker of the House. Um, John O'Brien, uh, her her friend and uh, colleague in the House, uh, they arrived in in the legislature about the same time. Uh, John was a very very skilled politician from uh, I think the Rainier Valley in Seattle, a, a classic Irish Paul, although absent the glad-handed aspects of that. John desperately wanted to be Speaker of the House, uh, and as did Julia, and they had sort of a gentleman gentlewoman's agreement that they were going to go full bore for it. Um, John's lieutenants that he enlisted, including the formidable. Uh, August P. Martisic, Augie Martisic of Everett, uh, a, a Croatian fisherman with brilliant legislative skills, 
Slade Gorton uh, maintained that 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 Augie Martisich was the smartest guy and most tactical guy he'd run into in, in terms of setting, setting legislation. Anyway, O'Brien's lieutenants out outmaneuvered Julia's, and um, so she lost by one vote. And the uh, the issue whether it's sexism or fear at a combination of the both. Mm. I think it was sexist that 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 most of those men w wanted a, a male speaker. Thought for all of Julia's formidableness that that she could settle for second second place speaker pro tem, or maybe their time would come. That moreover, that the, the other aspect here is the the Seattle orbit in the legislature versus what Julia and my friend uh, Lynn Kessler, a former uh, House ma Majority Leader, called the country mice versus the city mice. So the, there's a triangulation there of sexism, uh, the Seattle axis, and um, and fear. Um, mm. Dean Foster, uh, who went on to become Booth Gardner's chief of staff and uh, chief clerk, was a teenage intern in the legislature around those that time. And he told me that one day he was in the Senate and they and Julia came over from a visit from the House and they sort of ushered her down the center aisle going back and forth, dispensing people greetings. And uh, some of the guys were bowing and making elaborate gestures and others oh. were laughing. And one old Paul turned to Foster and said, this isn't funny. <laughs> this isn't <laughs> funny. This You may think this is a joke, but they're scared spitless of her because she's oh. got all this power. And so, wow. by the way, after she loses, the, the she's elected unanimously speaker pro tem. And she goes to Marta Sitch and some of the other guys who come up to her sort of sheepishly and say, no hard feelings, Julia. <laughs> oh, can't we get along? And she, said, she sticks out her hand and says, no hard feelings, but I'll give, get even with you sons of bitches. <laughs> and Adele Ferguson, Adele Ferguson, the uh, the legendary female correspondent for the Bremerton Sun, who showed me around the legislature on my first day as a legislative uh, reporter for the Aberdeen Daily World in January of 1967, told me that that uh, was there to hear that it, those immortal words. I'll get even with you, son. <laughs> John, something I, I thought of that we've not discussed, and that is, is it just coincidence you, that um, Julia, having lost her brother in childhood to the first traffic fatality in, was that in... Wakaiakum County. Wakaiakum County. Yeah, yeah. Was it just coincidence that then she became so expert on roads, highways, and transportation? No, not at all. There were two things there. The uh, the loss of her brother really uh, cemented um, Julia and her mother's uh, adherence to Christian science. Um, the Mary Baker Eddy's um, uh, writings, of course, talk about Christ as a healer and uh, and to eschew. Uh, and I, I'm not familiar with practices today, but but to rely more on the faith uh, to be healed rather than conventional um, medicine. Uh, Julia became, notwithstanding her uh, cussing, swearing, and drinking, became a very prayerful Christian scientist. Um, Maud even more so, and they both, they, they, Julia's interest in highways did in highway safety. And highway safety, um, I'm really glad you asked that question because I believe now that if I had it to do over again, I would have spent uh, a few more paragraphs talking about the, the traffic safety innovations that she uh, promulgated uh, legislatively uh, in the 1950s um, in terms of street sign standardization, uh, traffic safety education in the schools, driver education. And yes, the, the answer is very much so that the loss of Donald Butler um, played a, a key role in her concern about tri highway safety. Also, interestingly, in her interstate highway work, um, there was a, a really great, great quote from Julia at one meeting where they were talking about 
someone was saying, well, don't we have states' rights? Why do we need to standardize um, all these signs and things? Isn't that kind of meddlesome? And, and she pointed out that uh, a, a truck crossing a border doesn't know the difference between an Oregon highway and a Washington highway. And if, uh, if the signs are uniform, it adds to comprehension and can prevent accidents. Mm -hmm. um, so let's move, John. We could, boy, we could spend a lot of time on Julia Butler Hansen. Let's move to um, Julia's uh, election to the United States House of Representatives. Um, in 1960. And, and another thing I, I, I admire about your book is, again, you don't shy away from the complexity of this business. Um, can you give us, uh, the audience, a sense of what it meant for Julia to be one of the 13 so-called cardinals in the House uh, of Representatives? Why were they called cardinals and, and what power did they wield? They were called cardinals because, like the College of Cardinals in the in in the Vatican, they wielded enormous power. The uh, appropriations uh, is the is the mother's milk then, as today, of distributing um, key funds to key constituencies to to make government run. And uh, so, in 1967. Uh, the, the prelude to this, by the way, is that Julia and Lyndon Baines Johnson were mm. a match made in heaven. Mm. She first heard about, about Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 1940s when, as a young congressman, he connived to get his Texas oilman, as Robert Carroll points out so brilliantly in his biographies, that to get him to be the dispenser of congressional campaign funds. And Julia's friend, uh, Congressman Martin F. Smith of Hoquiam in 1940 was in a really tough election. That was the, the fabled uh, FDR growing for an unprecedented third term. The Republicans were resilient. They had a great candidate in Wendell Wilkie. And Lyndon Johnson, uh, Martin F. Smith, shared with Julia a telegram that she'd sent to, to Lyndon Johnson, of whom he knew little, uh, asking for money, saying, I desperately needed $100 for more newspaper ads. And the money alive arrived, lickety split. And Martin F. Smith said, wow, look at this, look at this guy. So fast forward to the master of the Senate, here's Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and then uh, ironically, um, Lyndon Johnson, the master of the Senate takes second place on the Kennedy ticket and finds himself uh, denigrated by the Kennedy uh, clutch of intellectuals as uh, Uncle Cornpone and mm. Julia, as much as she liked Kennedy's, the Kennedy's was offended by that. She thought it was really small. She thought the vice president was really smart, a master of the parliamentary procedure. The uh, Julia hopped a ride on Air Force Two to a dam dedication in eastern Washington, and she and Lyndon really bonded. And from then on, boy, when Lyndon becomes president of the United States, she had entree to the White House. She's there a lot. She's mm -hmm. getting signed pins at the, at, from every piece of great society legislation. Julia is there. So sure. the question about the College of Cardinals. In 1967, through a remarkable sort of series of, of coincidences, um, people higher on the pecking order on the Interior App Appropriations Committee are one loses for re-election. Another is the who is in the in line to be the head of the interior subcommittee. Chairman of the subcommittee decides he doesn't want it. He's got another committee chairmanship. And Julia, after only six years in Congress, becomes chairwoman of the House Interior Appropriations Subcommittee on, in, on Interior and Related Agencies. And what does that mean? That means the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Land Management, um, the Smithsonian Institution, uh, the National uh, the Society for the Arts and Humanities, and and she is really in a position. As Ted Nat, the editor of the Long Beach Daily News, pulled it, put it, it was like a dream come true. Billions upon billions of dollars are going through this committee, and and. Meanwhile, 
in the United States Senate, the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee on the Interior and Related Agency is her great and good friend, Henry M. Jackson. So between them, they're in the catbird seat. So these 13, these 13 uh, subcommittee chairmen um, held purview on the purse strings of, the, of, of all these agencies in the House of Representatives and were so powerful and things were so much more collegial then that albeit things still went to conference committee, but between there, these were Democrat controlled both houses of Congress and Julia's um, mastery as a parliamentarian. Uh, speaker Carl Albert, uh, the speaker that followed, they knew that, that, that there's this great scene though, that talk about sexism that she's um, she's bringing her first interior appropriations subcommittee bill to the floor of Congress for final passage. She had just immersed herself in every every bit of minutia about that. And so when she does it, the chairman of appropriations, uh, George Mahan of Texas, uh, a pal of LBJ's and really a tight fisted old Texan who was at first reluctant to give a woman the job and she shamed most of them and went around their backs and got everybody lined up so she'd get it. So Mahan gave a speech that it, on one hand on the floor of Congress is, um, is heartening, gratifying to Julian, but on the other through the lens of today is, was extremely sexist. It, it, the, the tone was sort of in a gentlemanly way, wow, look what a woman did. She brought this <laughs> bill to the floor with amazing attention to detail. She is holding a seat that no woman before her in the history of the United States Congress has ever held, and she did it. And 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 as society said, we'll never worry about you again, Julia. And so Julia <laughs> graciously accepted all that and, and got a standing ovation, and they passed her bill uh, with 13 dissenting votes. And from then on, nobody screwed with Julia Butler Hansen <laughs> in the Department of the Interior. <laughs> Um, uh, one example of the clout that came with being one of the cardinals, one of the people who was most in control of the federal government purse strings and the disbursement of that federal money was her work on behalf of Indian tribes. Um, why was um, she uh, so seemingly dedicated to helping the tribes, John? Uh, she, in Kathlamma as a girl, there were um, Kathlamet and Waka as a county seat of Wakayakum County and sort of being uh, that stopping off spot, the Columbia River there. First of all, it was an old Indian settlement. And before the white man came with all these gifts, including smallpox and other infectious diseases for which the indigenous peoples had no antidote. Um, there were a lot of old Indians around there. And the, the grandmother, remember the grandmother came west in the 1870s, and, and <laughs> Kathlamet was a Hudson's Bay trading post started by a former Hudson's Bay uh, agent. And so she grew up just steeped in this indigenous lore. There, the, um, the matriarch uh, in the, of the Bernie family was part Native American, and she had this, the stories are, are legendary about, she had, once a year, she'd set off for Willapa Bay in this huge canoe with like 10 or 12 paddlers and they'd go off and pick can cranberries and dig clams and come back. So Julia grew up listening to all that and that was what propelled her interest in singing paddles. Um, so when she, uh, all along the way, the, the, she was interested in the legislature, in the plight of the tribes, in particular of the Quinault Indian Nation, which in the 1950s was realizing that the Bureau of Indian Affairs had done uh, malpractice is too good a word for what they had allowed to happen on the Quinault Reservation. They had the Bureau of Indian Affairs in a, in a reckless uh, disregard for the environment that allowed contract loggers to leave acres and acres upon slash logging debris, clogging streams and rivers uh, to the real mm. detriment of the habitat in so many ways. Julia was incensed by that, um, came to the Quinault Nation 
early in her uh, tenure in Congress and made the acquaintance of a remarkable character that I knew well, well named Jim Jughead Jackson. And ja Jughead Jackson was the, uh, the grandson of the hereditary chief, chief to hold of the Quinaults, and was a tall, hatchet-faced character who at first could come off as one, one writer observed like a rough old logger, but he was a very, very sophisticated operative. And he saw in Julia and her emergence and her empathy for indigenous peoples, a real ally in the development of, of self-determination for the Quinaults and, and other, other uh, Northwest tribes. Um, Jim Jackson famously in the 1960s, uh, when they drew the line on uh, allowing the BIA to let any more of those destructive logging contracts on their land, he turned to his his um, his hand-picked and groomed uh, successor, a charismatic guy named Joe Delacruz, and said, "It's a time that we let the government know who runs, who owns the Quinault Indian Nation." And Julia was Julia was very sympathetic. Some of her critics have maintained that she didn't do nearly enough. Um, I, if Julia were around today, she might say. You're probably right, I, but I tried to do all I could, and she absolutely made a huge difference in on many many reservations. And during the the um, the takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the the late sixties, early seventies, the um, she called the one of the leaders of the uh, the emerging Indian self determination movement a, a brilliant a tactician named Hank Adams in the middle of uh, negotiations. And, uh, and Hank said uh, privately over the phone, she said, they ought, to tear that, they ought to tear that place down. She was so upset with the, uh, the um, bureaucracy, the, uh, of the- Inertia. The, the inertia, the, thank you. The inertia of the, of the BIA. So I, I think that Julia would candidly say, I wish I could have done more. But the um, the civilized tribes, what a title! The civilized tribes of Oklahoma <laughs> uh, gave her a, a banquet as she was leaving Congress, and uh, several other tribes um, named her as the one of the most memorable uh, advocates for indigenous peoples in American history. Um, and here's Julia, a a master of. Um, transportation and and highways and and um, all kinds of other matters and a little known um, facet I think about her was that she was uh, described as an angel um, to the arts and uh, there's a great story I think in, in your book about um, she just has no just blindly reaches out and invites the Hollywood movie star Gregory Peck to come to Longview, Washington. And Peck at this point is, is just huge. He, he is Atticus Finch, you know, from To Kill a Mockingbird. It, it, I, I was thinking it would be like, you know, George Clooney coming to Longview today, but I think Peck was even bigger than Clooney because Atticus Finch was such a signature character. Um, John, tell us about that um, event and and uh, how it played out. Well, I think it was Pauline Kael, whose book, the New Yorker uh, movie critic, who, whose book was called I, I Lost It at the Movies or I Found right. It or right. something like that. The, well, imagine what it was like to be growing up in a town of 500 people along the Columbia River in the, the 1920s and the, going to the movies uh, and, and then on into the depression was the, the great, uh, great entertainment for America, especially the advance of the talkies and Grable and, and Bogart and Gone of the Wind. Julia loved the movies, she loved the arts. Her mother was an extremely accomplished watercolorist, um, a gifted watercolorist. Colorist. Julia was, uh, when she became the chairwoman of interior and related agencies and the Smithsonian and the humanities uh, fell under her purview. She um, worked 
prodigiously to enhance funding in the Great Society for the Arts. And Gregory Peck, whom she adored from 12 o'clock high, that great role as the the bomb bomb group commander during World War II, and then Roman Holiday with Audrey Hepburn, and not to mention Atticus Fisk, Fisk this legendary. Anyway, so she wrote to, to, she thought she was gonna have a tough race in 1968, She'd done a lot for the arts already. Peck was the president of the Screen Actors Guild. Right, also right, right. a remarkable humanitarian as a past president of the of the National Cancer Society. And, mm. and she said in this letter, and the other thing, besides the journals, David Hansen has all the correspondence. It's incredible. <laughs> Part of it's at the University of Washington, but what he gave there, he's got copies of. So I've got this correspondence with Gregory Peck, and she says, I know you don't know who I am. And he writes back and says, I know who you are. You're an angel. <laughs> so he arrives at the uh, downtown theater in Longview for this fundraiser that, boy, they're queuing up uh, at 20 bucks a pop, which Julia thought was too much. And Gregory Peck proceeded to give a really stem winder of a speech about why the arts matter in America, why popular culture matters, about popularity. And he says, I'm not talking about popularity in the sense of Playboy magazine or, Ch or Charlie Chaplin. I'm talking about what it does to, to educate, to enlighten, to, uh, to illuminate. And it, it was, it, he, he, he was handsomer than George Clooney. <laughs> And he never strayed from her. He never strayed from her side. Uh, I think. And there was another occasion where Michael Landon. Uh, oh. if I found a picture of Julie in the archives of Michael Landon at some parade in Longview. Right wow. next to, is he? What is he? Little Joe or something? Little Joe and Bonanza. It's a long time yeah. Sunday night series. Yeah. And, and yeah. so anyway, uh, it was it was really a, a remarkable moment, and she raised. Her, her longtime campaign treasurer told her, Julia, you've raised $18,000. And she said, that's that's appalling. Ooh, why would we spend $18,000? That's obscene to, get, to spend that much money to run for re-election. Well, she, <laughs> uh, once she was elected to Congress in 1960, she won the uh, unexpired term of her late predecessor and the full term. So she had advanced seniority, but her the small her average victory margin between 1960 and 1974 was 62%. And that included <laughs> Lewis County. This is a Democrat who carried Lewis County, the right. where one wag once described it as being the headquarters of the fallout shelter industry. So <laughs> it's pretty easy. Yeah, um, those are all landslides, technically, uh, you know, every election. Um, uh, John, um, Julia could also be a, a stern taskmaster, not surprisingly, yeah, 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 uh, to, yeah. in order to be that successful, and, and a difficult, at times, critical boss, um, uh, and yet generous um, as well, regaling her staff with stories and her wisdom in a, in a leather booth in Washington, D.C., while she's sipping martinis and, and and gesturing with the swizzle stick. But anyway, um, can you tell us an anecdote or two about what it was like to work for her in Congress? Well, uh, Alan, Alan Thompson was her first administrative assistant. Alan went on to become a, a legislator and a, a clerk and a, a really terrific storyteller and an all-around great guy. Uh, his son Roland is the represents the newspapers uh, association. His son James is the CEO, I think it is, of the Port Association. And Alan was the when he met Julia had just bought the Kathlamet, the Wakayakum County Eagle. And if you were the editor, publisher, owner, and and delivery boy for the Wakayakum County Eagle, that meant you immediately. We're in Julia's orbit, and I, if I recall correctly, Alan is a Stanford graduate uh, and was had a career in Southern California as a pretty moxied public relations guy. But like a lot of us who've always dreamed about owning your own weekly newspaper, like James Reston and Tom Wicker did after retirement, that he bought this weekly newspaper and 
Julie gets elected to Congress and uh, with his help. And so he's our first administrative assistant. And Julia's longtime friend and aide, uh, a very bright and engaging state senator from Pacific County named Bob Bailey. She wanted him to take the job, but he said, I figured that she might get in one of her Miss Muppet moods and, I, and fire me for being so candid and I'd be stuck back there with my family with no way home. So Thompson is younger and doesn't know all that. And one day he finds out that um, to be Julia Butler Hansen's administrative assistant or anybody worked from Julia meant that if the boss lady worked 16 hour days, then nobody went home till the boss lady went home. And if the boss lady recharged her batteries by going to the legendary Monocle restaurant and having three martinis and six, six Benson and Hedges for lunch and a lot more than that for dinner, then you had to be there. And so anyway, Thompson was a really skilled writer and a great storyteller. One day they're, they're heading for this, this hearing and they're winding around the bowels of the Capitol and uh, Julia is reading as she's going along. She's looking at what Thompson's given her. And she says, Thompson, this is awful. This is the worst thing I've ever read. And he looked at me and said, that's the one you wrote. So she didn't say, I'm sorry or, or, or buzz off or whatever. She just put her head down and kept, kept walking. So here's this woman who, on the one hand, is this, um, could be warm and gracious and but on the other hand whether it was something that she felt the way she had to be to project strength she found it very very difficult to say i'm sorry david hansen tells this story that 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 julia was strong tempered uh, quick tempered and so was he and one day he's in his high chair and she hands him a bowl of post toasties or whatever a cold cereal and he expected oatmeal so he balked at it and she picks it up and throws it at him lobs it across the room and he ducked and then they both laugh so she's just she's uh, there we'll get to it in a minute uh uh when we wrap up but the, she says something about herself that in the end that really sums up this dichotomy of her personality. Right, right. And when we get to that, there's there's also, I believe, an example related of of she certainly could apologize. And that's what oh, wow. that's one thing I admire about her. Um, you know, if her temper flared, um, she could recognize that. And then she she gave these very kind of heartfelt apologies. Um, and uh, it just makes she's just such a human being in that regard. Uh, I'm going to quickly, though. Um, Can I tell you one quick story about that that's analogous to Lyndon Johnson? Sure. The, in, a, in a PBS special, or I think it was with Bill Moyers, Lyndon Johnson's uh, uh, longtime uh, press secretary, and, uh, and as we know, a brilliant journalist, also a Baptist minister, that Bill Moyers is at the LBG ranch one day, and there's a bunch of dignitaries around, and um, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, Moyers arrives on the porch, and Johnson dresses him down in the most profane way. Mm. I mean, blue smoke. I mean, you sound... And so Moyers is just kind of aghast, and he... He turns on his heel, heel and slinks off. And about a half hour later, LBJ summons him back to the front porch. And there's all these other guys looking on, maybe Humphrey and visiting dignitaries. And one of the ranch hands pulls up at a brand new station wagon. And, and everybody's surveying the scene. And Lyndon has the keys and hands him to Moyer and says, he's done a great job. And and. <laughs> And so then LBJ, he, Moyers hears LBJ turn to an aide and say, never give a man a present when he's already feeling up. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Right. Um, I, I just got to quickly um, add two of my favorite little anecdotes um, from your book. And that is that um, one of Julia's aides um, is asked if he has seen the new hit movie, um, Patton about the famously hard-nosed general, and the aide responds with, "I work for her." Uh, he does. And the the other one is about how kind of hard it could be to escape 
um, Julia's orbit and her gravitational pull. And there was a, a secretary who just like couldn't keep up anymore with all the work. And and so she concocts a story that she's going to get married as a, a way to, to slink out. And um, Julia throws her a, a splendid shower. Um, in fact, there's no boyfriend, not even, never mind a fiance. It was just it was what the secretary could think of as a way to get out of that orbit. And I loved it. Um, I, John somebody Rose, else, I heard that, I heard an apocryphal, perhaps apocryphal story that somebody else faked a pregnancy. It sounds like maybe even that, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe not that secretary, but yeah. another. Um, I want to um, quickly touch on um, the the fact uh, back to Julia's bond with LBJ. These two kind of master parliamentarians, in addition to more. Um, so she was actually invited to the White House to hear um, the address by LBJ that became his surprising announcement in early 1968 that he wouldn't seek re-election. Um, Julia. It had supported um, Johnson, uh, largely supported Johnson in his endeavors in Vietnam. Um, uh, but she had her regrets about that. Um, can you tell us about that? She, um, her support for the Vietnam War was um, based on her admiration for Henry M. Jackson, uh, the foremost hawk in the Democratic Senate and Lyndon Baines Johnson. But when the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which largely was a device to give uh, the president carte blanche to, to pursue, to advance the war, I, I think Wayne Morris and I believe Ernest Gruning of Alaska, there were Wayne Morris and one other senator voted against that. And she told David that night, she said, uh, I think they were right. It, I, I wish that, that I had had that prescience. Um, and she, um, and then later, uh, as things escalated, um, Tip there was a conversation with Tip O'Neill where she had said, and I found this in, the Tip in a biography of Tip O'Neill that David came across by happenstance. It's funny that do, do, you can, you can think that you've done a, a really uh, as encyclopedic as humanly possible job, absent the ability like Robert Caro to spend five or 10 years on a book. Neither you nor I have that luxury. But so I set out to read all the books I could find to see what Tom Foley and John O'Brien and Magnuson and Jackson and others, but I, I, I didn't get to Tip O'Neill and David Hansen found this uh, Tip O'Neill biography that quoted Yulia saying that the Vietnam War, unless we began to cut back, would be the ruination of the Democratic Party. Right. Um, she had uh, had real strong misgivings about that. Um, she it, she had a great fear of war. Her entries in her journal about about Pearl Harbor uh, coming on the the heels of her miscarriage are, are really moving. Um, and she, she'd been a child. Uh, during World War I when her mother was uh, working in, uh, as one of the uh, first female, one of the few female administrators for relief work uh, and Red Cross work. So she even dressed up during World War I as a, a 10 year old in a Red Cross nurse's uniform and wrote a play about uh, drafting the neighborhood children and her brothers to play soldiers and, and onlookers. and. Uh, so she had really strong feelings about the horrors of war. All through World War II, um, she was worrying about, she she knew about what was happening to, to European Jewry, uh, if not the full flavor of the Holocaust. And, and, and by the way, she had a very strong feelings from her work with that Jewish uh, um, Settlement house kind of operation in Seattle about about Israel and about um, the the hideous injustices of the hideous injustice of anti-Semitism. Yeah, and and your book um, really uh, 
does a good job at, at conveying how in Julia's life, um, you know, she saw World War One. She saw, we haven't even talked about the pandemic, but no. she saw World War One. Uh, she saw the rise of fascism and she was writing eloquently and in this kind of searing language that you've already alluded to about it, uh, the rise of fascism, World War II and the enormous loss of human life, the atomic bomb, all of this um, unfolded in her life by what? The time she was in her late 30s. Um, exactly. By the way, there is a uh, there's a chapter here that you and I have talked about in the past and I, you know, I forgive me for usurping the host but julia was a had strong bipartisan instincts to pass that 50 50 bill in 1939 she needed the support of those republican female legislators and the when she arrived in the congress one of the first friends that she made and admire was was margaret chase smith of maine and she had first become an admirer of margaret chase Smith of Maine in the 1950s when Margaret Chase Smith was one of those who had the 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 gumption and the indignation to to call out what Joseph P. McCarthy was doing in his reckless red baiting and in the legislature uh, uh, Julia and uh, John O'Brien a deep six an effort by uh, the the uh, Washington legislature's resident uh, McCarthy, Albert Canwell, to revive his freewheeling un-American activities um, investigation. Julia uh, had, there was a very telling entry in her diary from the 1930s about visiting uh, several communities, you know, hard hit communities, in southwest Washington, uh, boarded up logging towns, and she remarked it, it, uh, in the journal on one day, she said, it's a wonder that they're not all communists, that the unemployment was so high. Mm. But, neither, but neither did she, uh, was she any fan of, uh, certainly of Stalinistic communism. She was able to draw a distinction, though, as were uh, many uh, uh, right-minded people between the, uh, who, the genuine fear and anxiety of, of depression America between the, the intellectual leftist movements and Stalinism with all of its uh, hideous uh, excesses. The, 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 the Stalin's, uh, she remarked in one entry about that Stalin was as much a monster as Hitler, and he certainly was, that we know mm -hmm. in retrospect. But the, um, the Margaret Chase Smith uh, got 27 first ballot votes when she ran for the vice president for the presidential uh, nomination. The Republican Party gets Barry Goldwater in 1964. And uh, one of the things that Margaret Chase Smith always bristled at was the and it really offended Julia was the way journalists and other writers could characterize women in a sexist way. And I, uh, New York Times columnist Gail Collins wrote a really great book about older women in American history called No Stopping Us Now. And she, Collins wrote, the media seemed incapable of discussing Margaret Chase Smith's campaign without describing her as silver haired. She complained that almost every story starts off with a 66 year old senator. I haven't seen age played up in the case of men candidates. And the Los Angeles Times reported on the interview with a story that was headlined, 66 year old Senator Smith hits age talk. I'm talking about an irony, and Julia by then had endured 20 years of age talk. In the after the birth of David, she decided to stop tinning her hair and let it go silver, which it was really handsome. In, in her case, um, and she she um, she she said she had earned those silver hairs by dealing with quote dim bulb men, <laughs> and she. Uh, she, and she wondered, she, she wondered, I think, on more than one occasion, when those journalists were going to start describing the male politicians in, as overweight and with thinning hair. Yeah, and start yeah. focusing on an example of how uh, kind of unfair things were. Well, Julia was certainly... Um, uh, 
you know, a feminist, she might have not had the same style as some of the more flamboyant feminists like Bella Abzug, who came to Congress um, near the end of Julia's tenure. But, you know, without a question, when you look at her accomplishments, the 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 equal pay legislation, uh, both at the state and federal level, um, her support for the ERA um, uh, and other things, um, she she was unquestionably, uh, um, you know, a leading feminist of the time, even if she might not want to wear that term. Um, John, I would argue that she remains um, the most influential female in the U.S. House of Representatives from the state of Washington. Would you uh, dispute that or agree with that? Uh, with all due respect to Patty Murray, who has been a very formidable United States Senator, I would say that in the wide reach of Julia's purview as chairman of the subcommittee on interior and related agencies and what she did in this landmark legislation that you just enumerated, the Equal Pay Act, the Equal Rights Amendment, the 5050 Act, to right. say nothing, by the way, of what she did for teachers in Washington State in the in the 1940s and 50s to get them contractual uh, protections, better pay, better benefits, uh, mandating uh, kindergartens, uh, better busing, safer busing. By the way, uh, so yeah, I think I think we should look at Julia Butler Hanson as our most influential uh, female um, legislator in, in the United States Congress. The uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and that leads me simply in the interest of time. We, we could have a whole nother session on Julia and the many things we did discuss. But but I do, in conclusion, who was Julia Butler Hanson? Well, after Henry died uh, and she, by the way, when when, he, when Henry was uh, ailing and in his 90s and bedridden, um, the vow of for better or for worse in sickness and in health. She nursed him every day, kept him at home. And um, she was cleaning out a desk drawer two months after Henry's death, and she hadn't written in her journal for a while. And she um, picked up her journal and she looked at it and she mulled whether she should, um, with, she, she must have read through the a lot of these interest, entries, including these things that she'd written as an adolescent and a young woman about about being worried about allowing boys, to, about petting with boys. And in one case, uh, I, I, it's hard to believe that she went very far in the parlance of the, of the era, but she clearly did something that she regretted uh, with a boy with wandering hands and she excised several pages right out of her journal. It was like hitting the delete button. But anyway, she asked herself, <laughs> should she keep her diaries for posterity or burn them? Well, what a loss that would have been. Uh, and here's what she wrote on February 14th, 1982. I'm not sure about burning, yet that's probably the most sensible thing to do unless I preface this book with this. Only read if you have an understanding heart. For this is the record of a passionate heart, a woman with a temper, sensitive to hurt and pain, a tumultuous soul. It's the story of weakness and strength, the pain and joy and love. My public goal was to serve the people I represented as lovingly, consistently, and capable as possible. It's pretty good. Pretty it sure good. is. That's lovely. Lovely summary of um, Julia. Um, John, we should do a, a plug, of course. We, we have not done that. Where, um, how does one um, um, acquire your book or read it? Well, in this challenging time when uh, authors of, of all varieties, uh, famous and infamous and in between, are re resorting to online sales and virtual presentations and great programs like this to sell their books. You can buy the Julia Butler Hanson biography together with all of the other legacy Washington books, including Ahead of the Curve. And I have to tell you again, friends, Ahead of the Curve that I am so honored to have written with Bob Young is uh, a tour de force. 
the the women who are profiled in ahead of the curve are suffragists who with with gumption and persistence and resilience uh, one for Washington, the women, the vote 10 years ahead of the 19th Amendment. And then on the, in 1920, as the 19th Amendment is teetering towards um, uh, ratification, Washington becomes the penultimate next to last state to ratify it and on to Tennessee. And these early suffragists like Josephine Corliss Preston and Dr. Mabel Seagrave, uh, a physician from Seattle, went to the front lines in, yeah. in in World War One, uh, a society lady, uh, a a um, just a, a, could have had a life of privilege and a special practice as an OBGYN puts her life on the line and goes to the front lines and stays on afterward in the middle of a pandemic that claimed at least fifty million lives and a lot of experts think a hundred million possibly in the so-called Spanish flu. So we start with those two ladies and, and fast forward to these remarkable profiles, including Stephanie Kuntz, whom Bob profiled as this amazing sociologist that, that, that taught us about the way we, we really worked is so illuminating. And uh, so and, that's- and, a, and contemporary of, uh, of Julia, let's not yeah. forget, Elsie yeah. Parrish, the yes. chambermaid. Yes, who, yes. Who fought uh, for to be paid Washington's minimum wage. Imagine all, that. All the way to the United States Supreme Court, where somewhat surprisingly, because of the court's earlier decisions, she prevailed. And in essence, uh, opened the door for so much of the New Deal legislation that Julia's hero, Francis Perkins, the, the Secretary of Labor, was responsible for. And, and Francis ends up getting um, uh, basically everything on her wish list except universal health care. Um, Absolutely. Uh, what a story. Of, it, it is. A, there's a, a, a quite an amazing um, cast of characters in that book. Uh, Fawn Sharp from the, the Quinault wow. tribe, wow. who's now president of the National Congress of Indians. Uh, there's... Um, and many more, uh, from bridge builders to superstar geneticists, um, women who are ahead of the curve. And uh, so here's how you can buy these books. Just go to sos.wa.gov forward slash legacy, and it'll take you right to the bookstore. And I, I mean, there are, the, together with my teammates, we've just done some really re remarkable um illumination of Washington history in the past 12 years. And having Bob come on board three years ago was just um, heaven sent. But with the, here's uh, Jennifer Dunn uh, and her impact as in Congress. Um, the Booth Gardner, um, Nancy Evans, first rate first lady, a remarkable uh, activist in her own right. Not just a tea sipping first lady, but an activist for everything from abortion rights to the arts and entertainment. Um, and then one of my favorites uh, that we're we're going to reprise in this coming year, uh, hopefully to target the Black History Month, is a wonderful 92 year old woman we discovered in Kitsap County, the Rosa Parks of Kitsap County, Lillian Walker who arriving in Bremerton at the height of World War II when the, the population quadrupled, found that a lot of unrepentant old racists from the South had made the same journey together with, with uh, 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 Negroes from the South and the industrial North. And she fought together with her husband and introduced several landmark civil rights uh, laws, including one that uh, combated redlining. So. That seems a good note to um, sign off on, John. Thank you so much for for uh, being available for the interview, and um, thank you to all in the audience. And um, uh, stay tuned for the next edition of Lunch and Learn. But for now, I, I hope you all leave this um, thinking that uh, when you hear the name Julia in the context of Washington history, you are reminded of John's book. Um, so with that, thank you all. Good day. Take care.